<laughs> so, hi, I'm Juliana De Luna. So first, please feel free to just interrupt and ask me questions. I'd rather just go on and answer them. Um, so I am somebody who's been, who's always been sort of food adjacent in the SCA. I'm not a great cook. I'm not into that, though I hang out with a whole bunch of people who are. But what I am is a researcher who's done a lot of work on New World stuff and some on Spanish stuff. And so a few years ago, I got really interested in sort of collecting what we know about New World foods and how they got back to the old world. And it's been kind of an ongoing project. So I'm going to share with you what I know. I'll try to answer any questions you've got, tell you what I can. So let's get started. So to get started, let's just talk a little bit about how how foods got where they are and the like. So we usually talk about several centers of domestication. The important ones for what we care about are the New World ones, that is Mesoamerica, the area of Mexico and Guatemala. Um, a little bit from North America, though we're not really going to talk about North American stuff today, though tobacco comes from there. Um, the Andes and some parts of Eastern Brazil. All of these are places where foods came back from the new world to the old world, and in several cases kind of took over the world because it's hard to imagine a world in which corn and potatoes were not a key part, and, and for that matter, hot peppers, maybe mostly hot peppers were an important thing. So in the new world, there were relatively few animals that were domesticated, mostly because the larger domesticated mammals became extinct in the new world as the ice age came to an end and people moved into the area in really large numbers. So. The main crops we're going to talk about are sort of so starting with the big three Mexican domesticated plants that is maize, zeamayas, beans, frijol vulgaris, and squash, cucurbita species. The reason it's species is there's about half a dozen of them and they're pretty prolific. They interbreed with one another a whole lot. They were often grown together in Mexico, though this wouldn't be followed in Europe. Maize and beans are a really important combination. The amino acids found in maize and beans make complete proteins to give all the amino acids that people need. And so this combination of plants, maize, beans, and squash were grown really broadly through the New World from New England to Southern South America long before Europeans came to the New World. So some other things we're interested in from Mexico are chocolate, tomatoes, chili peppers, and of course their modern descendants, bell peppers. Again, we say capsicum species because there's actually, again, about half a dozen species but they also are easy to cross back and forth in easy ways. Um, domesticated animals included turkeys and Muscovy ducks. The mere fact that we go down as far as turkeys and Muscovy ducks tells you about that there weren't really many large domesticated animals except dogs. The most per important Peruvian domesticate is the white potato. Though plants like lima beans, peanuts, and quinoa were domesticated there as well. There is, of course, the large domesticated animal, the llama, is better known. The fact is that guinea pigs are the one animal that comes from the Andes used in period European recipes and kept as pets, as I'll show you shortly. Um, Juliana, we did have a question in sure. the chat. Your map, your map showed artichokes as North America. I thought they were available in the Old World in period. That's actually, I, that's, that should actually be Jerusalem artichokes. This is somebody else's map, of course, but that should be Jerusalem artichokes, I'm pretty sure. Thanks for noticing. Because Jerusalem, what we call Jerusalem artichokes are new world. Um, so keep asking questions. So in the lowlands, mostly domesticated in today's Brazil, though again, broadly found around the Caribbean are things like sweet potatoes, cassava or manioc, yuca, and a whole bunch of other tubers. If anybody cares for gory details, I can talk about things I've eaten in Central America, but most of them are names you wouldn't know like nyampi and nyami and things like that. Additionally, fruits like pineapples and of course, all those spices, things like vanilla and allspice and of course, paprika, which is just ground up pepper like other hot peppers. Um, most of the things that today we call berries are either new world or they're hybrids of new world and old world plants. Things like blueberries and cranberries are from the new world. Strawberries and raspberries are mostly today what we use are new world, old world hybrids. They were in the old world used before 1600. Modern blackberries, again, they're both new world and old world species. So they're really hard to say anything about. So a lot of nuts, 
things like pecans and hickory nuts and Brazil nuts and cashews are New World, though I don't really have evidence they were used by Europeans before 1600. And final grab bag, sunflowers, Jerusalem artichokes, see, told you I was getting there, and maple syrup all come from North America, while amaranth, tomatillos, guava, and papaya are from Central and South America. Um, and of course, you know, good alcohol too. Um, lots of dyes came as well. We're not going to talk about those. Tobacco, same thing. Um, modern cotton is mostly New World, but there were both New World and Old World varieties. If you know you want a further list, we can go on. I want to say really quickly before I go on that there are a handful of crops we associate with the New World that are actually native to the Old World. Things like sugar and coffee and bananas, citrus fruit and mangoes. It's also true of animals. The wild horses and burros of the American West are descended from European horses and burros that escaped. Sheep, goats, cows, and chickens were also bought, brought from Europe to the New World. There is, I should say really quickly, there's an argument about whether chickens in fact arrived from Polynesia. There's a tiny bit of, of evidence that there may have been some chickens in the coast of South America before the Columbian exchange, but they were never very many of them if they were there at all. And it's possible that what we're looking at is really post-European stuff that got misidentified. We just don't know. All right, there we go. So. Before we start talking about corn, the first thing I want to talk about, the Columbian exchange, as we call it, arguably begins before Columbus, so that there are people coming back and forth in especially the northern parts of North America, probably before Columbus, but really limited amounts. In the 1490s and early 1500s, Columbus does a series of voyages first to the Caribbean, then in 1498 to South America, 1504 Central America. And by around 1500 people are exploring up and down the coast of South America and by 1519 into the mainland big habit big um, the big conquest begins with Hernando Cortez's invasion of Mexico which will be conquered in 1521. From there conquistadors will move south into Guatemala and Central America by 1524 north into the American Southwest by the 1540s They'll be moving into South America by the 1520s and 30s. By the mid 1530s, the Spanish will occupy Cuzco, the Inca capital. Colonization of other areas will continue for a long time to come, arguably into the 20th century. But by the 1530s, the areas, most of the New World crops that are widely used were known to the Spanish. But most of them were slower to be transported back to the old world and use there. So big fields of corn and potatoes, cuisine based around the hot peppers and tomato based sauces won't come into use till well after 1600. But certainly in the 1490s, people like Columbus are experimenting with corn and with manioc food. So in Las Casas writing in the 16th century says that in 1492 Columbus says about maize, just to be clear, this doesn't survive, um, says that this grain has a very good taste when cooked, either roasted or ground and made into a gruel. In 1494, a letter sent back from the New World by a guy named Guillermo Coma says about maize, there's a prolific kind of grain the size of a loop and rounded like a chickpea. When broken, it produces a fine flour and is ground like wheat. A bread of excellent flavor is made from it. And again, in 1498, Columbus says that he's brought some maize back and quote, there is now much in Castile. The best is apparently considered excellent and most prized. So what that's saying is that before 1500, at least some maize is being grown in Castile. Again, on Columbus's second voyage, he brings back chili peppers, cacao, and maize, cacao chocolate. Um, I'm going to keep calling it cacao through here. Chocolate is, of course, the finished product. Cacao is the plant. Um, and so we keep seeing descriptions in accounts of what people are eating in the new world about maize. But here is what we know. So there's some genetic evidence that says that maize is brought back to Europe multiple times from multiple parts of the new world. Um, the maize we have is pretty diverse. Um, so 
want to ask if any of the maze that's around is really like that. Let me answer that in just a second. But the answer is it's hard to come by. Um, so Oviedo says that there's maize being grown near Madrid in 1525, near Avila in 1530. It's probably being found in Venice by that time. So this is obviously an image of maize from the from Fuchs. Um, but before 1520, there are images of maize found in Italy. Now, when we look at this maize, what we see is something that looks kind of different from the modern corn that we see in most cases. So if I were trying to do, if I were trying to get corn that looked like what we're using, I would be looking for the flint and dent corns that are used, for example, to make tortilla chips. That's the one place where there's been sort of an attempt to do this. Obviously, you can see it most frequently in blue corn, but what you would be looking for in corn varieties, if you can see this kind of corn, is the, the you see how the, um, the kernels aren't sort of filled in like they are in most modern varieties of corn where the, the kernels, there's just no separation between them. You can find modern forms of flint and dent corn that still have those traits. They're not going to be exactly like what was used before 1600, but they're going to be as close as we're going to get. And so that's kind of the stuff that I would be looking for. So by 1554, it's described as a standard crop in the area around Venice. Now, I got to say really quickly that trying to figure out when and how corn is used in recipes, especially in, um, in Italy, turns out to be incredibly hard because they're using a word formentone, which means big wheat. But the problem is it's also being used to describe buckwheat and maybe a kind of einkorn wheat that's being grown at the same time. Today, that term is used in, um, is used almost completely in, um, to mean corn, but in period, it's not. Scappy says, for example, it is a grain much larger than that is which is to use to make bread. And in Lombardy fun finds it in, in, um, in quantity. But again, are we talking about corn, maize? Are we talking about buckwheat? Are we talking about something else? What's certainly true is that by the 1580s or around 1600, we can start seeing real evidence of it. So Heloise was teaching about her work on Scappi and others uh, last hour. And you know, so for example, Mattioli says in her trend in her work, I believe that the temperament of the corn of India is similar to ours or a little hotter, which is evidence in the sweetness of its bread. It makes white flour, which can be used for bread, the body of which is coarser and clammy than ours. So by 1600, they are making essentially cornbread of some sort in Italy. Um, we also know, so that's one of the places where it seems to be far more important in Italy in our period than in pretty much anywhere else. In other places, it seems to have mostly stayed kind of a, a curiosity. By the way, what's interesting is that in Spain, they seem to be growing more potatoes. Don't ask. It, you know, it's a question of what gets taken on, the corn will later on. So before I move on, let's see, I think I'm moving on at this. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about um, about corn and what we know about it? I'll try to answer it. Um, yeah. Every, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Do we have any recipes using what might be corn so that we can figure out by what they're doing with it, whether it is corn? Um, the problem is that what they're doing with it in Italy, for example, is they're grinding it into flour. The, and, as far as I know, maize does not work for uh, a yeast raised bread, I don't think. At least it's usually done with chemical leavening, whereas wheat right. does. So that might let you distinguish between the two. Right. I mean, so explicitly, just as an example, what I just read, it is described as the corn of India, which is clearly maize, right? But there's not a recipe to go with it. So, you know, it's very clear in Italy, they are making bread out of corn, out of maize, but I don't know what they're doing How, with it. And I haven't seen any recipes. Do we but have any you, good you reason can... to believe it's really from India? That is, no. you, get things, you get things like turkeys, which are oh, not yeah. from no, Turkey, no. and Turkish pepper, which, which is not from, yeah. from Turkey. 
Absolutely. No, describing it as corn of India here, I mean, just to be clear, you, you're quite right. So India, Turkey, all kinds of guinea for that matter, guinea fowl, all of these terms get used to talk about things that are randomly exotic. India is, of course, a particularly problematic term because it's being used to describe both the West and East Indies. And in another project that I'm working on, I'm trying to figure out some stuff about New World people and people coming from Asia. And it's an incredible difficult because they're all just described as being Indians, whether they are from Goa or whether they're from Mexico. And so the same thing is true of things like corn of India. But in this case, it's pretty clear that here, when they're describing corn of India, they mean maize. But and you can make you can make uh, a yeast corn a yeast raised cornbread if it's a corn and flour wheat flour bread. Right. Yes. Yes. I, the, yes. I, I, I was about gluten. to say the same thing. Yep. Absolutely. Can, I'm can a you make a corn? Can you make a straight cornbread without chemical leavening? Because although there is apparently chemical chemical leavening in the Islamic world by this time, mm -hmm. I don't know of any evidence that there is in Europe. Although Italy had ties with the Islamic world, so it might be possible. Right. You, you, can't, you can't make it without, without a chemical leavening if you're just using corn. However, yes. it's possible to do a like 50-50 or even 60-40 grain yes. and corn mix mm -hmm. and have it work out just fine. And it's entirely possible since, you know, that what she quoted is certainly not a recipe yeah. Yes. That they that somebody was doing that and they and right. that part of it wasn't mentioned. So do we have any do we have any evidence of people separating out the gluten? Because you can separate gluten. Again, I know in Islamic yes. recipe where you're getting the starch and throwing away the gluten. And I'm wondering if if maybe it's not very likely, but if one could find somebody who was specifically getting wheat gluten and combining it with corn meal. Yep. Nobody's seen that, neither have I. No, no. Um, so here's I have what... seen mentions of that in early Italian sources, but I think more importantly, because this is not a specific recipe, right. the word bread may be being used in a yep. much looser term than we are taking it in this moment. Exactly. So Gerard, I'm, pull, I'm, I'm staring at my quotes right now. Gerard does, says, the bread which is made from maize, he doesn't actually say that, but um, is mealy white without bran. It's hard and dry as biscuit is and hath in it no clamminess at all for which cause it is hard of digestion and yieldeth to the body little or no nourishment. And so that describes some, that seems to suggest something that's a non-risen kind of flat mm -hmm. bread of the, yeah. and and so that's, that's, that's later, it's Gerard, it's not Italy, but it's certainly, that one suggests, yeah, a non-risen kind of bread. Uh -huh. So, but no, I've I have not seen any recipes for maize bread. Just lots of descriptions of people eating it, or not lots, but but descriptions of people eating it. So, have you looked past period to see if there are seventeenth century? I have not. Um, there is so there's this fantastic book called Maize and a Grace, right? Um, that's sort of about the history of maize that goes much further forward. And I have, while I've read the whole book, I haven't looked at recipes in it. Hmm. Um, I could look into it, but like I said, I'm more interested in sort of the food history of the hmm. sort of thing that I am in the recipes around it, but I should, I'll look into it, but I don't, I have not up till this moment. I was um, mostly just thinking the recipes might give you clues as to what's going on. Yeah, and if there were, you know, yeah, I don't know. And of course, you know, I got to say, so I'm a Southern girl originally. And in fact, one of the family recipes is a corn light bread. That's a corn, you know, that's exactly that. It's a, it's a yeast bread with corn, with cornmeal and flour and does exactly that. So, you know, it's certainly true that there's lots of later examples of that, but, but and, I and don't know here what they're doing. And if I may, I'll, th I'll throw out uh, something from uh, my wife's research uh, into uh, uh, why th some things were considered kosher for Passover and not kosher for Passover. Uh -huh. You think corn would be kosher for Passover because you can't make it make a cornbread rise. But the problem is that, uh, as somebody else alluded to, you'd have blends of corn and wheat. And now, in fact, in some cases, intentionally blended to contaminate the corn flour so it couldn't be used by the Jews. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, part of, part, of, uh, part of culinary history is a little bit of a... Uh, uh, 
not everybody got along that yep. well. Way. Yeah, so so for what it's worth, yes, I did typo Janik's name there. It is in fact J I N I C K. Um, I just typoed it as I was copying things from one document to another. My apologies. Um, I believe Patrick and Tabby raised their hands. Did you please. guys have a question? Uh, the uh, excuse me, the whole thing about um, corn in in Italy. My first thought was. If it, any of it was, if there was any evidence, any of it was used in the making of pastas. So again, the big, so once again, of course, the big place where corn will come to be important is in polenta, right? So early polenta is made out of, of random grain, mostly wheat. And at some point, corn completely overtakes it. But it's not clear when and where, because we have this endless problem of the language for corn being muddled compared to the language for other kinds of grains. And of course, just a reminder for anyone who doesn't know it, the term corn, in fact, in Europe continues to be an imprecise term that can talk about whatever the native grain is. So that if you're talking about this with people from Europe, you have to use terms like maize. And so technically that's the language that we tend to use. So, you know, so polenta is made out of all these different grains. And then at some point, corn just, you know, eats it because it's good for doing that. Um, but in terms of corn pasta, I haven't seen any descriptions of it, but it wouldn't shock me. But again, I think there's a great lack of recipes, just like there's a great lack of recipes for bread to try to figure that out. Um, so, so just a reminder. So put these a little out of order for my notes. So here we go. So peppers. So pepper is a plant that really quickly people come to identify as filling the niche of black pepper. In fact, Columbus is described as having realized that this is this stuff would be amazing as sort of a spice. So Oviedo, in the mid 15th century, sorry, mid 16th century says that Europeans are using pepper in the new world and that it's quote now imported to Europe. They're found in Italy by 1535 in Germany by 1542 in Fuchs and in southeastern Europe and Hungary by 1569. So in 1542 Fuchs says that the plant has only recently come to Germany but they're now grown widely. He of course says it came from India because, you know, everybody says everything came from India. By 1560... The Hungarians say it came from Turkey. Well, yeah, that's the Turkish other place pepper. where everything comes, right? Um, it probably came to Germany from Italy. Mattioli in 1568 describes hot peppers as thoroughly well known. In the 1560s, um, Constanzo Felici describes the pepper of India, the pepper of India, as good for those who enjoy black pepper and describes them as being grown in pots. In other words, he doesn't mean it pepper from India, he means American peppers. Um, by the 17th century, Clusius says that it's grown in Castile, both by gardeners and by housewives, used all year round as a seasoning, either dried or in the form of the freshly picked pods and says that in 1585, he had seen vast plantations of it in the suburbs of Brune in Moravia. So again, Gerard describes it in England where it is quote, well known in the shops of Billingsgate by the name of Ginny Pepper where it's usually to be bought. Um, so by the 16th century, peppers seem to be used really broadly as a seasoning and as a replacement for black pepper. The idea of eating sweeter peppers in sort of other kinds of vegetables doesn't seem to be um, doesn't seem to be something that folks did. So, earliest picture I could find of a pepper from 1540. Um, there are the pictures from Fuchs, and you'll note that in Fuchs, he's actually describing multiple varieties as different kinds of varieties of the same thing. So by then, it's that common. Um, squash. Squash are sort of the instant takeover. 
there are old world gourds that were cultivated pretty standardly. Of course, there's lots of recipes for them, but new world squash were recognized as being the same sort of thing, only better. And so almost instantly squash take over. So here we have a book of hours from the first decade of the 16th century showing what are clearly new world squash. Um, How can you tell they're new world squash and not Lagunaria? Oh, it's white flowered? Um, yeah, the, the specifics, uh, the, the answer is I did not do this identification. Um, somebody else did, and it's a combination of the flowers, the shapes of the leaves, and not so much the shapes of the squash because gourds and squash have pretty similar shapes, but it's the flowers and the shapes of the leaves that led to those identifications. Um, and if you bug me offline, I'll tell you who identified those because I gave the source, but not where, um, where I got, where they got it from. Um, so again, Mattioli and Scappi in Italy talk about new world squash. Sorry, white flowered is Lagunaria and the new world ones I believe are yellow flowered. So I think that the, the middle picture there, I think has to be Lagunaria. That could very well be. I will tell you, I did not do this identification. Yes. I took it from someone else's work. So, you know. I think the two on either side are yellow flowered. So they're probably showing both the new world and the old world gourd in that picture. If that would look, make sense. Yellow, yellow yeah. flowers on those and white flower here. And you'll note the difference in the shape. Once you say that, the difference in the shape of the leaves as well. So that, that new world squash tend to have those sort of palmate leaves with multiple things. So you're right that that middle one is probably an old world gourd. Um, you're quite right about that. Um, so Mattioli and Scappi both describe recipes for squash. They talk about how the seeds are good to eat too. Um, and say things like, they taste sweet and are not bland like ours. Um, and again, Gerard's herbal, herbal describes several kinds of pompions, that is to say pumpkins. So let's take a look at those. Here's some more images. This one includes things like pumpkins. These are from, again, the Villa Farnesina in Rome, second decade of the 16th century. Um, and so clearly squash it's again it's really hard for a lot of recipes to figure it out but it certainly looks like by gosh the end of the sixth but my bet is that by the end of the 16th century that new world squash have just almost thoroughly displaced old world squashes because you know they're just in important ways a, a, a better product which is one of the reasons that it's really really hard to find old world gourds you can find them at the right asian market but pretty much everywhere else around the world, the new world squash just kind of jump in and take the place of, um, of these others. So. I think I've been told that in Italy, they still wear, still use Lagunaria, but I could be mistaken. Wouldn't be surprising. So smaller ones, bigger ones from the Villa Farnesina, right? I'm sure there are a few places and you know like I said you can get them even in the United States you can get them at the right Asian market though you've got to be very careful about it in the process so called OPPO yep so potatoes again sorting out what's going on with potatoes is an interesting problem because while there are in fact separate words for sweet potatoes and for white potatoes, for much of our period, the terms are used kind of interchangeably and mostly seem to be talking about sweet potatoes. Um, so. So of course, just to remind everybody, sweet potatoes and white potatoes are completely different, not just species, but genuses. They're grown in completely different places. Sweet potatoes are a lowland crop. White potatoes are a highland and Dian crop. It's just, we call them by the name potato in both cases. And similarly, they will get called the same kind of terms in Spain where they're both often called the batatas early on. Though today there are two different terms and period, they're often called the same thing. And there's also a lot of confusion everywhere we go. So that today the unmodified potato means a white potato, but for most of our period, the unmodified potato means a sweet potato. You can see this here, for example, this is from Her Gerard's herbal. 
And you know, the potato means the sweet potato. So most of the recipes that we see that just talk about potatoes are probably sweet potatoes. So and there's a class on potatoes tomorrow. There is, there is. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so sweet potatoes were brought back from Columbus on his first voyage. Um, Oviedo again says in the 1520s that he brought some more back to Avila, Spain. Um, I can't find very much evidence early on that they're used in Spain, but the foreigners all say they're used in Spanish cuisine, so presumably they were. Um, and we do find recipes both for sweet potatoes and for white potatoes. By now they're using, by in 1599 in Diego Granada's Libro de Arte de Cocina. So he gives examples of, of both sweet potatoes and potatoes. Gerard talks about potatoes, but he means sweet potatoes. And he says that in Spain and Italy, they are common and ordinary meat. He says he bought some of it at the exchange in London and tried to get it going, but the plants died. But he also gives ways to prepare it. Um, I won't belabor those. So somebody will have to uh, do that. So there are recipes for them, in, for example, in 1596 and in 1615 in Europe. So the, so the answer is that potatoes seem to have been, to have come to Italy mostly in late periods. So really quickly in Spain by 1553, we have accounts of white potatoes being grown. So that's 20 years after the Inca empire is brought under Spanish control, which is the main area where potatoes were grown. There are barrels of white potatoes being shipped from the Canary Islands to Antwerp in the 1560s and to Rowan in the 1570s. 1570s are being fed to the poor in Seville from local production in the, sorry, in the 1570s. But we don't know exactly when they came to be done. So 1623 account says that potatoes are being grown near Florence before 1587. But we don't know when they began to be used in, um, but yeah, we don't know when they began to be used in, in Italy, let alone to make things like gnocchi. Again, I cannot imagine it's not well post period, but I just don't know when. Um, basically all the, dis the descriptions of people eating, um, eating potatoes in our period are mostly eating potatoes that are roasted or boiled or otherwise prepared as potatoes or in tarts. Those are kind of the ways they're being described, but sort of the idea of mashing them and doing something with them doesn't, well, no, that's not true. Sorry, there is isn't. There is a 1599 recipe that, that has you putting them through a sieve and then doing stuff with them. Um, but I don't know when they started using them in gnocchi. And again, the answer appears to be after period. Yeah, so the answer of yeah yams and other sweet potato like substances is that in lots of different parts of the world there are these lowland low protein tubers that all kind of get mixed together today in our language about sweet potatoes and yams and all kinds of other things so so yeah the modern version again if i were trying to look for something like a period sweet potato, you're gonna have to look pretty hard because indeed the sort of modern, the yams, which are not sweet potatoes, right? They're yellow, not white skinned and so, not, excuse me, fleshed are different. So, but white potatoes, basically the answer is there are recipes for them in very late period but sweet potatoes seem to have been way more important. It's hard to figure out what's what. So let's take a look at a few more pictures real quick. Um, so here are, here are potatoes, that is to say white potatoes from Clusius. Um, so this is seven, seven, early 17th century. Tomatoes are also an interesting problem to sort out. Um, the real problem again is that there are two different things today, right? The mod, okay, thank you for clarifying that they're roots rather than tubers. I know very little about the biology of yams, I will confess. Um, one of the complications of figuring out what's going on with tomatoes is that to modern tomatillos 
are again described using the same sets of words. This is particularly true in Italy. Um, and interestingly, tomatillos seem to have come to Europe earlier and more systematically than tomatoes. And then once tomatoes get adopted, that seems to drop away. So here we have an image of a tomatillo from an Italian source, late 16th century. And tomatoes proper here from the 1550s. So what do we know? We know that mo we know that by the later 16th century, tomatoes are being eaten in Italy. Um, the first real mention is in the 1544 herbal of Pietro Andrea Mattioli, who says that another species of, he calls them a kind of mandrake, has been brought to Italy in our time, segmented green at first, and when ripe of a golden color, which is eaten just like eggplants, fried in oil with salt and pepper, described as being like the way you cook mushrooms. Um, and so they're eating them boiled and roasted and other kinds of things, but not sort of raw. Again, in the 1560s, they're described as being like eggplants in terms of how you eat them, but they're also not good, right? They're a food that looks better than it tastes and give but little and bad nourishment. Um, first described in Germany in the 1550s, um, herbalist is growing both red and yellow varieties, but again, they don't seem to be described as, as something that people are eating. Um, in the 1560s, again, in Germany, they're described as a fruit that is, quote, orderless, not unpleasant and not harmful in food, but he can literally name all the people who are growing it, so it's not something that's in general use yet. In the 1580s, a Dutch writer, Matthias Dobel, describes the Italian habit of eating tomatoes saying these apples are eaten by some Italians like melons, but the strong stinking smell gives one sufficient notice how unhealthful and how evil they are to eat. Gerard is growing them in England by 15, 1597, says that in Spain and in those hot regions, they used to eat them prepared and boiled with pepper, salt, and oil, but they're not good. Um, and actually says that they're using them mixed together for sauce to their meat, even as we in these cold countries do, mex do, excuse me, do mustard. So they're starting to do things with them in late period, but not on any kind of large scale, but they're there. Meats seem to have just slotted seamlessly into the European food traditions. Um, turkeys, of course, and Muscovy ducks fit into the existing poultry tradition. The earliest reference we can find for sure to turkeys in Europe is in the 1520s when, or sorry, in 1520 proper, when two of them were given to an Italian cardinal. There's some discussion about some possible earlier descriptions in the early 1510s, but not clear. But Catherine de Medici serving them at a feast in Paris in 1549. They're being served at the inns of court in London by 1555. In 1573, Turkey well dressed is described in England as Christmas fair. Um, and again, in 1589, Hakluyt says that turkeys have been there for at least 50 years, so by the 1530s. Um, in pre in pre Columbian times, in the Old World, the So in the new world, it's Muscovy ducks. In the old world, it's a variety of different kinds of ducks. Ducks, of course, are weird and problematic um, in terms of even today, ducks interbreed even things. So in all seriousness, even like different things that we think of as different genuses of ducks actually interbreed. And so sorting out sort of what the varieties of ducks look like over time turns out to be incredibly difficult because ducks are even in the wild, weirdly promiscuous. So um, while that says that, that while the, the something that someone shared in chat says that one of the oldest recipes known to, for turkeys is in Libro de Arte de Cocina, the Diego Granado book I've been talking about in the 1590s, there is in fact recipes in Scappi, both for turkeys and Muscovy ducks and also for guinea pigs. Um, so the recipes are, of course, for the Gallo d'India, the Conilio de India, and the Anatra de India, because everything's from India, right? So 
the duck of India, the, tur the chicken of India, and the little pig of India. So guinea pigs. A bunch of those recipes are then repeated in um, Rumpolt's new cookbook. And so while this picture is from there here, there's even a picture of a turkey in Rumpolt. So that's from a, that's it here it's described as an Indian chicken, an Indian hen, right? So again, there are recipes in Libro de Arte de Cocina in 1599 for both, again, turkeys and also for guinea pigs. Yep. So just a reminder, guinea pigs have an interesting life. Um, to this day, guinea pigs are good eats in the Andes. They, are the, they were sort of the standard small um, thing you ate. Um, but in period Europe, they seem to have become both pets and also is continuing to be food. So this is a relatively recent thing. And you can see it's an Elizabethan portrait of children holding a guinea pig. So pets and also food. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up and, you know, let's, are there other foods that particularly people want to know about? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on chocolate, for example, because there's again another class about chocolate, so I don't want to step too much on it. Oh, beans. I didn't talk about beans. Thank you. I forgot my, I didn't have a picture in here of beans, so I forgot. I skipped right over it. Hang on just a second. So let's talk about beans. So most of the things that we call today beans are various forms of freehold vulgaris, um, which is again an incredibly diverse kind of, um, of plant. And again, freehold vulgaris will come to quickly, though not completely, displace a group of old world crops. Of course, the most important old world bean are fava beans, but they're also, you know, chickpeas and lentils and peas and other kinds of things. So the earliest recipes that we can for sure say are new world beans are these green bean recipes, of which there are a large amount. Gerard, for example, suggests that green beans are adopted pretty quickly, but that, that they're not using dried beans, that is to say the beans, nearly as much. So by the middle of the 16th century, there are lots of Italian cookbooks that are giving recipes for new world beans, so they don't always distinguish them. So for example, the 1557 Cristoforo Mrs. Bugo describes a recipe for fresh beans in the pod, which is almost assuredly, again, being uh, freehold vulgaris, new world beans. In 1562, Turner's Herbal talks about them as kidney beans and talks about how you eat the fruit together with the seed and you eat it like an edible herb rather than if, as a bean. Yeah. If you eat the favas young enough, pod, bean and all is fine. Mm -hmm. It's just when they're more mature, you have to separate them. Right. So it's possible that that pods and all was young fava. Okay. Yeah, and I'd also like to add that the young beans might also be Zinga, the cow pea, black eye pea, because like the Tanticum centalis, so there's an image of harvesting them green. Okay. So that might be another kind of cool old world bean that maybe they were using green too. Right, exactly. I mean, it's really, again, it's very hard to figure this out. Um, what's clear, so Gerard clearly differentiates kidney beans, which are the new world variety from beans, which are fava beans. And you know describes this. So this is this is a Gerard recipe or lack of recipe, right? The fruits and cods of kidney beans boil together before they be ripe and buttered and so eaten with their cods are exceedingly delicate to meat. Um, but and says they shouldn't be eaten when they're ripe. So at least he's thinking very much in terms of green beans. So at what point, you know, at what point the new world beans really start to substitute in face of the old world beans is less clear because both of them are often just called beans. Um, Heloise de Berkstad argues that they're pretty quick. And it's certainly true that the new world beans, again, have a lot of advantages over the old world beans. Um, so by 1599, Diego Granado, right, that Spanish source, is distinguishing frisoles from habas. 
So frisoles or modern frijoles, that's new world beans versus habas, which are fava beans, right? And so he's using both, many of them are fresh ones, but he's also using recipes for frisoles de secos, that is dried beans, which he also mentions, you can also do with peas, you can also do with, ha ha with fava beans, you can also do with lentils. So at least in Spain by 1599, it's pretty clear that dried beans are being used and may be perceived as more interesting to use for these kinds of dishes than are, um, than are these other, than are fava beans and peas and lentils. Um, so in Italy, it's so hard to figure out because they're all just kind of described as beans and it's not until much later that we start seeing a really clear distinction between the two sorts between fava beans on the one hand, which are of course still consumed or the, the new world beans that come along. Um, so there was a question about- We have just peanuts. about Sorry. five minutes left. Perfect. Peanuts. Peanuts. I have not been able to find very much about peanuts, which is a sort of interesting problem. Um, it's on my list of things that I want to find out more about. So I'm going to have to punt on that one and just say, okay, sorry, don't know. Sorry about that. They come into West Africa. They come into West Africa quite early with the results. Yes. For a while, people thought they were African in origin. Exactly. And that might give some kind of a clue to whoever was dealing with West Africa, maybe Portugal. Yeah, Portugal. You might right? know. Right. I mean, and of course, that makes a lot of sense because they are, again, a lowland crop that would be really suitable for that. And yeah, I, I, you know, I've been doing just in sort of a non-food side, there's just some really fascinating things that are happening in the Congo area between Portugal and, and local elites that are just really fascinating. So yeah, but yes, it's there's, true. There's, there's someone in, um, it's either Meridius or Glenarvan, someone, you know, down south. Mm -hmm. who is, uh, whose rabbit hole is period African food. So there is somebody out there who possibly has the answer on peanuts. That's very it's interesting. They're just not here today. Right. That's very, very interesting. Um, you know, so I, I started on this, I will, I will say that I started on this from the point of view of someone who's really interested in Mesoamerica. So I, mundanely I am actually a cultural anthropologist though I've also taught archaeology and so I start at it from sort of the focus on the Spanish New World which means that you know the things that are that come through other routes I'm less sort of knowledgeable about but you know but it's certainly true that peanuts are an interesting problem that I need to spend some more time on but that so far it's just it's one of those things that's really hard to sort out so any other questions about life the universe or anything Either I've been really complete or just there's too much there. I don't know which. So feel free to post. It would make if you life find... much simpler if we move the cut if we move the cutoff back to fifteen hundred. Ha! Would be really? a um, I have a question about uh, not so much some of the vegetables, but some, but some of the spices. Thinking specifically mm -hmm. about allspice, right? Which I know is a new world, uh, uh, but I. I'm wondering uh, how much of an impact that had on the uh, old world uh, use of spices. It seems to have been kind of slow. You know, it's weird and it's hard because there's a whole bunch of, there's a huge amount of change that's going on, right? First is suddenly in this period, there's much better access to the East Indian spices such that, you know, but it's still, but they're still large, they're still rare and hard to come by. So I, I, you know, weird little side thing. So one of my favorite weird stories in all of this is there's a story that in sort of early 16th century um, Spain, a whole bunch of people got really excited in Brazil because they found out that there was a ship coming and it was full of clavos, cloves. And then they found out it was only full of esclavos, slaves, just to think, clavos, esclavos, right? pun and then they were all disappointed because you know cloves were much more valuable than than human merchandise uh, what about so, vanilla you haven't mentioned vanilla vanilla How did it come into use yeah vanilla seems to have been really slow to come into use um and again the only suggestions 
I can think of off the top of my head of it coming into use is there's all this weird, interesting spicing stuff that's going on with this other new thing I didn't talk about, which is chocolate, right? So chocolate, of course, in the new world as it's being consumed is being consumed as a beverage that's bitter, right? It's not sweetened and they add things like chili peppers to it and other kinds of, it's a savory thing. You can think of it as like coffee or tea that way. And it comes back from the old world to the new, sorry, from the new world to the old world that way. And then sometime before 1600, they start sweetening it. So that there are these recipes from Italy, for example, that have these new world spices like vanilla being added to chocolate as a drink that's now sweetened. Um, but they're adding weird stuff to it. And I haven't seen it anywhere else. And I wonder if part of that is about the shift in sort of the ways in which we make sweets really changes, you know, in sort of the gray period and on into sort of on, on towards 1700. And I wonder if sort of that stuff takes off then. All spice seems to have sometimes been used, you know, in that melange of all these Eastern spices because it's the same kind of thing and everyone recognizes it as the same kind of thing. But because of that, again, it's really hard to sort out. So that's all I got. Um, but I'm doing some more stuff on spices needs to be on my list. Yeah. Juliana, Juliana, okay. with your interest in um, Mesoamerican food, are you familiar with the book Food? Conquest and Colonization in 16th Century Spanish America. I'm not sure I am. Oh, it's a it's a cool little book. Okay. I thought you were going to talk about, I thought you were going to mention Sophie Coe's uh, chocolate book. Oh, um, well, yes, that is the yeah. chocolate book. Yeah, exactly. No, that's just. I put, I, the I put the title there in the chat so you can look it up. Okay. I'm actually pulling it up right now on my other computer since I have it both. And Katie um, asked about avocado. So avocado was clearly grown and consumed in the new world. I don't know of any evidence that it came back to the old world quickly. Um, no, in yeah, fact, the only thing on avocado I've got uh, is first described in 1519 by a Spanish explorer who's founded in Colombia. Yep, that that sounds about right. I don't actually have a date on it, but. It's clearly being grown. In fact, it's it's just so it's one of the fairly early um, domesticates. It is also, of course, easy to find because it's got big pits, right? Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know when it got brought when people started eating it in the old world. But my bet is pretty late. But I don't know. Other questions? Yep. So I want to thank Juliana for her class. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, just you. as a reminder, lunch, lunch was shortened. So lunch is starting yeah. now and you have until one o'clock when the one o'clock classes will start back on our regularly uh, created schedule. If you have any problems, you can go back to the main lobby and one of the moderators will help you in getting into a new classroom. Yep. And just so everyone knows, I'll be posting both that and then also there's sort of an article version of this that has a bunch of those quotes in it that I'm also glad to, to put up so that people can take a look at it. So have a good one and I will see you all in other classes.